Okay, folks, it's uh, 3.30 p.m. EST, and uh, we are about to start our next session. So next up will be Blockchains for Business 101 with uh, Gordon Huff. And uh, the session uh, will run as a recorded session. I'll share it. Uh, you have a link uh, in the chat window in case any technical difficulties watching it here. And uh, we'll have uh, Gordon to answer the questions after the presentation on, in this channel. Let's, let me try to share it. Hi, I'm Gordon Half, technology evangelist with Red Hat. In this presentation, I'm going to take you through what enterprise blockchain is, or distributed ledger technology if you prefer, some of the reasons that you might be interested in using it, some of the conditions that may mean it really is not the right technology for you, some of the areas in which blockchain is being used, and then finally, what is Red Hat doing with blockchain? Thank you. Let's start by talking about what a blockchain is for our purposes here. Uh, we're not talking uh, ICOs. We're not talking Bitcoin or other types of currencies. Rather, we're talking about enterprise blockchain. And what that is, is a shared permission distributed ledger technology visible to and the transactions validated by members of a business blockchain network using a consensus protocol. Now, that was a whole lot of words there. So let me break that down a little bit. First of all, uh, the distributed ledger is shared by those members of the blockchain network. Those members are permissioned. This is not a public blockchain. Uh, you have business entities of some sort who have some sort of trust relationship, doesn't mean they trust each other 100%, but they have some sort of trust relationship, and they are participating together using a consensus protocol. And uh, again, what consensus protocol means, you probably have heard a lot about that in the context of Bitcoin, where something called proof of work is consensus protocol, and it's very energy intensive because it involves essentially mine, doing cryptographic mining. In the case of permissioned blockchains, other types of consensus mechanisms that don't require, that, that do require a certain degree of trust among the participants can be used instead. Uh, and basically, the it doesn't need to be all the members of the, the network, but you basically have voting nodes that decide whether a transaction is valid or not. Uh, there's no central repository. This is a distributed structure. And there's usually no central authority, although that is not an absolute requirement. You can have central authorities. Uh, for example, a company might use a blockchain in conjunction with uh, its suppliers, for example. And in that case, it still is a distributed ledger, but you do essentially have one central authority who is deciding who can participate and deciding what the rules around that blockchain are. Uh, and then one additional element, and you see this on the top layer of the diagram there, um, is that you have these things called smart contracts that can be used to take actions based on predefined events. So for example, if you if a transaction completes, if you receive a shipped good, if you um, send money to someone, actions can be automatically taken in with respect to uh, that transaction being completed. So a good is delivered, a payment is taken in response to that good being delivered. Just to very briefly go through what the architecture of a blockchain looks like, I already mentioned the smart contract saying they're up on top, but you have a series of blocks. Uh, and that, well, all, all block is is a collection of transactions. And you'll see some other features um, in those blocks. You send called a Merkle root. Uh, all that means is you have a cryptographic hash 
uh, all of the transactions that went that are going into the block. Um, and then you have um, and then you have a hash of the previous block header. And the reason that this is interesting is that's what forms your chain of blocks. So if you go back in time and say alter the contents of one of those blocks, then it's obvious because it, because those changes percolate down the chain, and it's obvious that there has been some alteration has happened uh, in those previous blocks, and that has um, various types of implications, which I'll get to. And really, the interesting part, I think, of the technology isn't necessarily so much the technology itself, but rather the characteristics that the technology. Uh, create with result um, with respect to how blockchains can be used, and essentially, a blockchain lets you build a decentralized business network. And actually, many elements of that network are very familiar to things that we have today. So you have a network of some sort connecting different businesses who are partnering in various respects for purchasing goods, delivering goods, paying for things and so forth. Uh, all of those participants have an identity. And um, in the case of business uh, networks, those are typically a known identity, although they could be synonymous in various ways. Uh, assets of various types flow over those business networks, uh, money being digital uh, currency, um, Fiat currency typically uh, can be one of those uh, one of those types of assets, but also the digital representation of goods, uh, information about uh, the network participants, and so forth. Um, transactions, just as in today, they describe some sort of asset ex exchange. So, um, you know, loans for cash, uh, cash for goods, that kind of thing. Um, you have some sort of legal frameworks underpinning those transactions. So if I deliver this to you uh, on such and such a schedule, you're going to pay me this amount of money. And then you have a ledger to log the transactions. And that's the actual blockchain that we are talking about here. Um, I'll give you one example to make this maybe a little more concrete. And I'm using uh, Hyperledger as the example here, um, this is a foundation underneath the Linux Foundation, uh, which contains a number of important blockchain uh, projects. Um, it, you, the actual, you have the actual distributed ledgers, uh, Hyperledger Fabric, uh, which I'll talk about a little more in a bit, um, is one of the more popular uh, blockchains distributed ledgers for enterprise use out there. Uh, and other project which I'll highlight up there is uh, Hyperledger Indy, and that's primarily focused on uh, distributed identities. And there have been some very interesting projects that have been done with Indy, for example, uh, in British Columbia and Canada, has set up essentially something they call org book. And it's a, essentially it's a it's a canonical source of information about companies. Um, then one of the things that Hyperledger specifically has been doing around blockchains to uh, a lot of focus on making things modular and reusable. So for example, Hyperledger Ursa is a set of cryptographic libraries that can be used by different uh, distributed ledgers. And particularly in the crypto space, one of the reasons that's nice is uh, cryptography has a couple of important characteristics in the context of blockchain. It's A, it's very important, and B, it's very important to get right. So if you have a bunch of different cryptographic uh, implementations out there, there's a lot more opportunity for things to go wrong as opposed to having one shared library that can be used by a bunch of different projects and can be vetted by a bunch of different projects. And you've got various other shared libraries there as well. Now, this is what I think is going to be the actually the interesting part of this presentation. I just sort of wanted to set things up for you a little bit. But 
I think where it gets interesting is what can you use distributed ledgers for? And conversely, what might you not want to use them for? So I think the way to think about where you might want to use distributed ledgers is to think about some of the characteristics. And one of those characteristics is distributed trust. No single entity controls the storage and validation of transactions. And if we kind of think about how business is often conducted today, there's a lot of checks and balances that go into establishing different types of trust relationships between entities. And one of the interesting things that blockchain does is it's a way to um, essentially uh, trust but verify in a way in a business blockchain network. So the, the sort of the cryptographic setup of the whole thing is one way to uh, not absolutely guaranteed. I, I, I think there is a mistake that's sometimes made in thinking about blockchain is that, oh, blockchain eliminates the need to have any sort of trust relationships. Blockchain does everything. And even in a permissioned blockchain like this, I would argue that's not completely true. There's still kind of the idea you need the rule of law, you need to uh, enforce contracts at some level, even if they're smart contracts, you need a legal system in the event of disputes in the case of maybe bugs or mistakes. Uh, but it certainly does provide a way for entities with at least some level of trust in each other uh, to cooperate in a lower friction sort of way. A second characteristic, which is interesting and is also interesting because it's something of a double-edged sword, is the idea of immutability. Uh, as I went through with the way that the blocks are chained together using cryptography, um, you can't just yank out a, a previous block. And if you change it in some way, it's going to be obvious that it has been changed. Uh, changed. That actually has implications, though, for how you use blockchain, because uh, that's different from a traditional database where a controlling entity can make changes to records, and sometimes you want to make changes to records. You want to, um, say, expunge transactions after a certain length of time, uh, um, say, past retention, re legal retention requirements or whatnot. And you, you can't do that in blockchain. And there's actually been some discussion that has gone on around things like GDPR and whether that's a problem for blockchain in some circumstances or not. And one of the sort of architectural implications of this is you give this idea that there is some information that is on the chain and it connects to other information is off chain and that information is off chain can be deleted and changed and so forth. So the the sort of the thinking is that when you architect your application, there may be some information you actually do keep on the blockchain and then other information that is essentially not immutable uh, and is incorporated essentially by reference. I think this is maybe one of the big ones with blockchain, and I'll kind of tell you why in a moment, is that you have this idea of parties securely interacting, and there's a single source of truth they can all agree to. Um, and another way to think about it is there, there was a common message bus for recorded actions that connects entities in a standardized way. And one of the I think, questions early on around blockchain chain, particularly in an enterprise context, was, well, if these parties kind of trust each other and maybe there's a governmental entity that sort of oversees this all anyway, why can't you just use a database, you know, have parties communicate like they do today? And what it turns out is that uh, in, real, in real life, uh, everyone's a lot of people are using different systems. There's reconciliation needed, uh, and so forth. So even if there are 
essentially trustworthy systems that exist today, um, it actually turns out to be a lot harder to reconcile everything than uh, you might think it needed to be until you dive down into the details. I mean, in the U.S., uh, we often don't get tax, you know, our, our tax records from our finance companies until maybe the end of February or something like that. And one of the reasons for that is the need to reconcile a lot of um, disparate systems that weren't originally designed to communicate with each other. Um, but why not blockchain? Um, you know, I've told you all the reasons it's really kind of cool and wonderful and you should use it for everything, but why, why might you not? And the answer is sometimes conventional databases are, are just fine. Um, you, you have a single entity in control and, uh, all their, you know, and all their suppliers have processes that they need to follow in order to interact with the mothership's uh, database and records, and that may be a perfectly good way of uh, of doing things. And you know, I just talked about uh, immutability. I mean, there are some advantages to having a mutable database that you control, and you don't need to worry about this immutability feature of blockchain. Um, a company wants to have this really centralized control. And I'll, I'll talk about this in a, a little more in a second. And also, uh, uh, performance definitely continues to be uh, an issue with, with blockchain. It's something a lot of work's being done on. But certainly, if you have very high throughput, high data type of transactions, uh, and maybe those other characteristics of blockchain or maybe nice to haves, but they're not necessarily um, critical, maybe a database is better for those types of high transaction uh, applications. Um, the participating entities are all part of the same trust domain. Uh, you know, you know, I guess a good example of this might be within a particular company or within a very closely linked set of uh, organizations in the public sector where pretty much there's a there's a sort of a common level of trust, a common level of access. So you don't really need this sort of distributed trust kind of relationships. And uh, because again, the, the it's not an absolute rule, but you can think about distributed trust in these business networks and there is some level of trust for them to have been let into the business network in the first place. But they're, in many cases, competing entities. So uh, so they're definitely not in the same trust domain. I mean, they all have secrets. And yeah, we could probably argue that within a given company, you have organizations that have some secrets of their own, but is is obviously a, a very qualitative difference from a bunch of external separately incorporated parties who are who are cooperating uh, for business reasons. Uh, assets can, that can't be reliably digitized. Um, and this kind of, I think we can worry about this too much. I mean, for instance, in the supply chain area, which has been one of the early use cases where, where blockchains had some success. Um, you know, people, people ask, well, what if um, you have forged documents? Or, you know, what if the inspection the customs official said was done wasn't really done because it got slipped a bribe? And, and those are absolutely legitimate, uh, legitimate uh, concerns to bring up. However, I think sometimes we can get into the, the perfect being the enemy of the good in these kind of discussions. And even if you kind of make it harder to forge, uh, you know, forge shipments that don't actually exist and that kind of thing, if you making a, you know, even if you eliminate, you know, 75% of the fraudulent uh, 
are unverified transactions, that may still be a win, even if you can't really get there, uh, you know, 100%. But this is certainly something to think of. And, uh, and you know, I, I think some of the proposed use cases for blockchain, uh, like some of the uh, bland title verification and so forth, when the problem is, is that you have very fragmentary records that are scattered all over the place in dusty county clerk offices and situations like that. Um, yeah, blockchain would be a good answer if you were maybe starting over from scratch, but it can be very hard to uh, deal with those legacy undigitized systems. This has been a big problem Early on, I think some of the early supply chain work in particular struggled with this, that, uh, that you, have com you often have competitors who are participating in these business networks, and they're often not used to this level of transparency and cooperation. They're not willing to give up that control. They're not willing to change their existing practices and fundamentally they just don't want to cooperate with each other at any level um and under those circumstances it can be very hard if you know if you if only half your suppliers will sign up for the blockchain it's a lot less useful if most of them do so so i i think in the open source world where where i do a lot of my work We've, we've kind of gotten used to working together in open source software in, in this way where competitors are working together on an open source project. However, um, I, I think it's still very hard for in many industries for organizations to think about things in that way. And then finally, then you know, this um, probably doesn't need much of an introduction or preamble. Uh, but as with many other things, if you're if you're using blo introducing blockchain to solve a problem that really isn't yeah it's kind of ugly and legacy and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, we have a working system. It's not a big deal, you know. Maybe just leave it. Um, these are some of the early use cases that we've seen in blockchain now. If a few years ago you were at some presentation in this general vein, uh, you'd probably see slides filled with you know, hundreds of uh, small print types of places where blockchain could have an impact. And, and we certainly see uh, pilot and even production projects in a pretty wide range of areas. Um, but these are the ones that I would say we see most of the activity. Uh, finance is a big one. Um, they're already used to digitized electronic networks. Uh, some of the biggest think, opportunities in, in the near term that we've seen in finance are in various types of lending and, and international transactions in areas where existing middlemen are missing or they're, they're very expensive. So for instance, we've seen a fair bit around international transactions of various types in areas of Asia where there have been fewer low cost and well-established middlemen of various sorts built up as they tend to have been in the US and Western Europe. Um, Public sector, um, I, I mentioned the British Columbia example of a business network uh, and various types, and this is closely related to that, of uh, identity. The British Columbia example was actually using Hyperledger Indy. And so governments are kind of interested in that in terms of ID cards, business records, that kind of thing. Supply chain and provenance uh, has been has been talked about a lot and is absolutely having some success, uh, such as a food trust network, for example. There's a lot of concern about uh, if there is an outbreak of um, you know, bad food of some sort, the desire to really identify that very 
quickly and not having to be backtracking through records that may be incomplete and that might take you know months or more uh it might take a month or more to uh definitively spot the source of the outbreak by which time it may very well be too late to do much about it um healthcare records this is certainly a great hope, particularly in places where electronic health care records have been, have a bit of, bit of a mixed bag. Uh, I think this also points out, though, to some of the challenges with, with blockchain is to a degree that entities can agree in standards, to a degree that entities don't want to participate in networks. Uh, Blockchain can't really solve that political aspect of things. It can it can really help the technical aspects, but if entities are not wanting to cooperate in that way and put their heads together and agree on standards and processes, blockchain isn't going to magically waltz in and solve that problem. Um, and I think other types of identity, I mentioned kind of the public sector in particular, but there, there is a lot of interest in this idea of people having self-sovereign identities and uh, having more control over their identity records than there's a real mechanism to today. And then finally, there is interest in the telco space in here. You know, again, this, this has to do with there's a lot of transactions among a lot of different entities and doing the billing and reconciliation for all that. Um, close and start talking very briefly about what Red Hat is doing here. Um, we're participating in select industry organizations and engaging with uh, customers and partners. One of my um, colleagues, uh, Mark Wagner, is in both the governing board and the technical steering committee for Hyperledger specifically. Um, we are enabling Red Hat products. Uh, there were some security uh, things related to how Hyperledger Fabric specifically was using uh, Kubernetes OpenShift, for example, which Mark and others uh, have addressed, uh, so that you you can run you, you can run in RHEL, you can run on OpenShift, uh, and one of the and towards uh, having Hyperledger Fabric on OpenShift, one of the projects that's, that's going on is development of uh, an operator for Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, for those of you not familiar with operators, it's um, something that actually came out of CoreOS originally, which Red Hat uh, acquired uh, for Kubernetes and for, open, for OpenShift. And if the idea is that with these increasingly complex Pro, pro, products, uh, you really want to, to uh, codify some of the operational knowledge in order to make uh, to, you know, to make code uh, to make code work, and therefore, and the idea with an operator is that we're you're essentially putting the operational knowledge in order to deploy and do the ongoing management of that of the software that. The operators for uh, and have it in a um, operator hub that you can download and then use. Finally, before going to q and A, I'd just like to clarify that one of the things that we're not doing is a Red Hat blockchain product. So we're enabling Red Hat platforms to run blockchain products, uh, starting with Hyperledger Fabric, uh, but we do have no plans to sell our own product. Uh, we, are, we are really agnostic about technology uh, in terms of which particular blockchain platforms uh, we work with, but we've today had the most customer interest around Hyperledger Fabric. So with that, uh, we have a little time for Q&A. And I am here if um, uh, just jumped out of the little box into the bigger box, uh, if anybody has any questions for me. Feel free to type them into the chat. Um,
Going once, going twice, going three times. Well, um, thank you all for spending some time. And uh, the, as you can see, the video, um, the video is on YouTube. So, uh, you know, feel free to share it with anybody who you think might be interested. And the uh, slide links are also going to be posted in the schedule and uh, the, the slides are up in SlideShare. So thank you all for your time. And I hope you're having a great DevCom. Thank you. Gordon, thank you very much. It was a great presentation. And uh, I think everyone was impressed by the quality of it. Um, and uh, now let me check our schedule. What's going on? Okay, take care, everyone. And uh, our next presentation is uh, scheduled to start in 20 minutes, uh, 4.20 Eastern time. And uh, we will have a small break prior to that because uh, our log out and to log back in in order to uh, keep recording going. I'll see you all in 20 minutes. <laughs>